Good afternoon. If you're just joining us, uh, we will get started in a couple minutes. We're just waiting for everybody to join. So go ahead. And if you want to, uh, you can check out our chat features or just mess around in the chat, um, kind of chat with us or see how we're doing. Or if you want to tell us where you're from, we'd really appreciate that while we're waiting to start. All right, so it's about six o'clock, so we'll get started. Hold on, let me just hide this. Okay. So uh, to get started this afternoon, um, so just a little disclaimer at the beginning, uh, this is a family program, so just make sure that you are, you know, being appropriate and being respectful of other people in the chat. Um, you know, making sure that you're not putting any, you know, bad comments or anything like that and just being respectful overall. So that would be appreciated. And you are attending the Endangered Native Fishes of Nevada. So we're going to go over quite a bit today, but to get started, um, we're just going to make sure that we all know how to use the chat features. I see a few people that are pretty frequently attending some of our programs, so I hope this shouldn't be too big of an issue, but um, just make sure that you are set to this little blue part right here, making sure it's all panelists um, and attendees. So it should kind of have a similar drop down so that everybody can see your messages when you send them in. And then also um, just with this chat feature and the Q&A, um, you can just use the chat to respond to any general questions that we ask. And then also the Q&A for any of your own questions for us um, as well. And to get started, uh, my name is Caitlin, and with me is Amanda, and we are both AmeriCorps educators with Nevada Department of Wildlife. So Amanda will be here helping me out and kind of making sure, helping me answer any chat questions or anything like that. So feel free to use the chat freely and uh, don't be afraid to have any conversations or anything or reach out to anybody else who might be in the chat. Um, I really love to see everyone kind of interacting and learning. So this is definitely something that's super important to me. And we're gonna use this icon a little bit 
Um, so it just means that there's a chat opportunity. So we'll kind of test this out. So if you are here, um, if you want to tell us why you're here, so maybe you care about fish, maybe you're an angler, a fish lover, you care about endangered species. Um, I really care about endangered species, which is why I made this program. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear about why maybe you're here or um, you know what you are interested to learn today, anything like that. So if anyone wants to share, please feel free to. Okay, so a lot of people are interested in endangered species, awesome. So yeah, endangered species are super important to learn about, um, just to be more aware of them. Awesome, so um, if you do have anything you wanna contribute, maybe you have um, questions or anything like that, feel free to just put them in the chat as we go along. So today, uh, just a couple of things that will be discussed, uh, endangered fish species, obviously, and then just some of their life history, uh, some of the major threats to the habitats of these species and then also um, some of the challenges that we have for helping these populations, and also some of the plans that we have, um, not just Endow, but also just other entities, or um, just some of the things that have been done in the past as well. So one thing that's important is the relevant terms. So these terms are used in a lot of different ways, but we'll just kind of apply them to today's lesson. So um, invasive, uh, that's a pretty common term, especially when we talk about wildlife but that just means um, a species that didn't originate in an area and actually has pretty negative or destructive impacts. Then we have endemic, which is quite the opposite. So it's a species that is found only in the region or a greater area. So endemic can be applied to any, um, I guess, range of a region. So you could be talking about maybe just endemic to Nevada or endemic to a very similar, like a small area that would be inside of Nevada or endemic to the United States in general. So today we're talking about species that are endemic to Nevada and certain parts of Nevada as well. And then we have non-native. Um, so non-native just means a uh, species that didn't originate, could be invasive, but they might just have a neutral or maybe even positive impacts. So they play nicely, they don't really, um, you know, destroy our endemic or na uh, native species. So they're not as much of a problem. And so to understand our endangered fishes, super important to under understand the Endangered Species Act and also some of the other legislation that protects our wildlife in Nevada. And with that, we have the Endangered Species Act, which was, um, approved under Nixon in 1973. And this is actually the more evolved of two previous pieces of legislation. Um, so we had the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966, which was the first one, um, but it didn't really offer very good protections. Um, so they created the Endangered Species Conservation Act of 1969. However, there were still a lot of disputes and it only protected really game species um, or like migratory birds. So they wanted to extend it to a bunch of different species. So plants, fish, other wildlife as well. So not just anything that could be considered commercially um, important. And so overall, this prohibits the unauthorized taking possession or sale and transport of listed animals and plants. Um, but overall, this uh, actually gives authority for land acquisition. So if there's anything that we believe is significant habitat for an animal that will be prioritized over, um, for example, maybe land development for housing or residential purposes or even commercial purposes. Um, and then species can be listed in two ways. So one is by submission for review by a fish and wildlife biologist or also by petition from the public, which is why you'll sometimes see like, you know, petitions going around on the internet to put a species on the ESA. And this is enforced by state and federal agencies. So we've got the US Fish and Wildlife Services, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Services, and then also some of our state wildlife departments or state parks departments as well will manage these species and also make sure that they're um, being used properly or that they're not you know, being trafficked or anything like that. And in Nevada, we have NAC 503. And this uh, kind of involves a bunch of different things. So it's not just endangered species, but also classifies a bunch of different species. So 
one of the things that classifies is um, exotic wildlife. So making sure that it's not released illegally into the natural environment. Um, it lists uh, game species, protected uh, species and endangered species as well. And a number of uh, fish species are actually protected under this legislation. So protected just means that maybe they're not endangered, but we still wanna kind of extend protections over them to make sure that they're not being um, overfished or declined or anything like that. And uh, these are kind of outlined and categorized in here and our game wardens are able to kind of determine, you know, are you fishing for the right species? You have the right tag or not tags, but um, maybe licenses for a certain species. Uh, but tags also do apply for some of our other game species. So when it comes to enforcement of these wildlife laws, it's incredibly important to know what you're doing. So if you do go out and fish, you need to know what species that you're ending up on your hook. So, uh, you know, plague ignorant isn't going to save you in this situation. It is your responsibility that if you are interacting with wildlife, that you are being responsible about what you are fishing and what you're taking. And I guess if there's any death of wildlife that is involved, even if it's an unintentional. And there are some protections for some of the fish in Nevada. So for example, our kiwi is endemic to the Pyramid Lakes area. Uh, so this is only a catch and release fish, whereas like the Wahan cutthroat trout, which is threatened, um, I think you can take up to two fish or one large uh, Lahontan cutthroat trout. So that's something that's super important to know before you go. Um, the other thing too is that boats need to be inspected on our waterways. So this is super important to make sure we're not bringing in any invasive species. Uh, for example, this zebra mussel has caused so many problems throughout the country. Uh, and you might think, what does such a small little thing do? Uh, actually it can clog waterways, clog piping, um, you know, a bunch of different problems. It's a huge problem for our industries and it also competes with a lot of native species. So when it comes to listing and classification, I'm sure some of you have seen this list, but um, we're mostly focusing on animals that fall in this area. So this is going to be vulnerable species, endangered or critically endangered. Um, and those are kind of where we wanna focus our attention. So it could be a really big problem if you get these animals that end up or plants that end up in the critical area. So they still all follow, uh, fall under threatened and they could be listed on the ESA. But there are a few ways that these can be, uh, I guess, classified. So if there's a present or, you know, very large threat to their habitat or range overutilization, um, the species is declining due to disease or predation, uh, there might be inadequacy of regulation. Um, and also, lastly, they have natural or man-made factors affecting their existence. So these are all things that need to be considered as well. And Nevada is home to 18 fish species that are listed in the ESA and several candidate species. So we're gonna be talking about 10 of these species today um, just because I don't have time for all of them, unfortunately. But we do have a few hotspots. One thing I realized when I was uh, kind of creating a species profile for all of these fish is that they all have one very big thing in common and that is habitat degradation. So they have really bad decline in their habitat. And there are some areas that are worse than others. So some areas include the White River area, which is kind of in South Central Nevada, Amargosa Valley, and then also the Colorado River system. Um, those are where we found like the biggest declines of fish species and also biggest problems with habitat loss. So Amargosa Valley, um, if you don't know where it is or Pahrump, um, it's just about a little bit Northwest of Las Vegas. So we have a couple species that are in this area. So we have our prompt pole fish, which was listed in 1967. And as I kind of referred to earlier, this is before the ESA, but it was relisted again when the ESA was made. So the prompt pole fish, they're roughly about three inches in length and they're the only remaining member of its genus. And they actually prefer temperatures of about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, but they're pretty tolerable. Um, in 1975, these three populations were actually transplanted from their native springs due to a planned depletion of groundwater. Uh, so this was a problem. Uh, biologists knew that this uh, complete habitat destruction was happening. This is the only place that they occurred. And of course, the groundwater was about to be depleted. So they actually moved those populations to three different areas. So Shoshone Springs, Corn Creek, and Spring Mountain State Park. 
Uh, two of these actually aren't far from their original um, habitat, so that's pretty nice. But one is over in Ely, so it's pretty far away. But overall, they were doing really well um, up until the late 90s. Uh, they were trying to get them delisted, but then a huge flood happened and took out a bunch of the population, so they had to reevaluate that and keep them on the ESA. Then we've got our ash meadow speckled dace, and they're one of a lot of different speckled dace subspecies that are in the area. Uh, this one used to actually occupy 10 or more streams in the ash meadows region, but it's been reduced to just uh, three springs, roughly around 1985 is when that started happening. Um, it eats just algae and microinvertebrates, and they're about four inches in length. So uh, these fish are not very big. Even the prump pole fish is only about three to four inches, so they're not huge. And then we've got three pupfish subspecies. So we have a ton of pupfish in this area. They're all in the same genus, uh, Cyprinodon. I think that's how you say it. But um, so they were listed in 1967, 1982, and 1970, respectively. Um, but part of the reason why all these pupfish are so spread out is that Death Valley actually used to be a pluvial lake, and then it dried up in the late Pleistocene but it left these small isolated pools of pupfish that were all originally a part of the same species, but then speciated due to isolation. So now we get all these crazy different pupfish species. Um, but out of all of them, the, um, let me see. So the Amargosa pupfish is I believe the, the biggest, it's six inches. And they have, all of them have this kind of bluish hue or silvery blue kind of look to them. So they're all pretty similar, but they just have different sizes and a slightly different behaviors. Um, but the Amargosa pupfish particularly are super resilient. They can survive in a lot of different ranges of water salinity. And also they can survive pretty severe drops in water level when it dries out in the summer. Uh, so they can survive in like six inches of water. So it's pretty crazy. Uh, the Devil's Hole pupfish, if you haven't heard of it, was a huge trailblazer to the ESA. So it kind of got the ball rolling for people to start caring about um, endangered species and also their habitats. They're only endemic to Devil's Hole, which is a huge cavern that goes um, pretty deep. I think it's like 300 meters or so down into the earth. And they're extremely susceptible to earthquakes um, and disturbances because of how low that they are, that um, they're pretty sensitive to seismic activity. So they have some trouble down there with uh, disturbances and also having like frequent issues with their population numbers. So that's a big problem for them as well. And then the ash, um, sorry, the warm springs pupfish occurs in about six streams in the Ash Meadows area. Uh, so it's still pretty common, but it's having a big problem with recovering as well. And if you're wondering where this area is, I kind of highlighted it on here. So here's Las Vegas, and then there's Amargosa Valley up here. Um, it's pretty cool. This is like where the, um, I guess, Area 51 stuff is. So if you've ever been driving down to Las Vegas or in between, um, and you see that crazy gas station with all the Area 51 stuff, it's right here. But if you can, you should go visit Ash Meadows. It's really beautiful, and it's got lots of cool wildlife. So some of their threats, I already kind of talked about some of them, but competitive with non-native fishes and other species. So mosquito fish is a problem. Also um, red swamp crayfish are a problem as well. They have groundwater depletion, which is a really big problem. Um, so it's been redirected for agricultural use. And actually back in the 1970s, um, there was a group that was trying to actually establish a town in Ash Meadows that would have tried to serve about 55,000 people and it's a good thing they didn't because doing that would have completely uh, diminished the groundwater or completely depleted it. So it was not a sustainable option. And I'm glad that nobody decided to actually go ahead with that plan um, because it would have completely ruined this wetland area. Um, and then they also suffer from natural disturbances like earthquakes I kind of talked about, but also um, temperature changes since it is a desert and it gets really hot. Um, and then uh, just other natural disturbances, so loss of prey. Um, but with the pupfish, uh, they've been dealing with kind of changes in groundwater. But the problem is that when it gets too low, that it starts separating populations massively, and you get too many pupfish in one area, a very small area of water that can't survive. There's not enough food to go around. Also, with a small body of water, it's much more susceptible to chemical imbalances. 
So that's a huge problem as well. And there are a few challenges with managing um, this area. So for example, groundwater usage uh, is becoming even more of a problem because of local cities like Las Vegas. Um, and as the population in Las Vegas grows, more people move out to areas like Pahrump. Um, and with a growing population, it's obviously going to have more water demands. Then we've also got protection of ash meadows from some of those non-native species and invasive species. Uh, but once they're established, they're extremely hard to remove. Um, some of them being our American bullfrog, which have uh, tripled in population size and also the red swamp crayfish, which is another problem as well. So why is this area super important? Um, well, it has the greatest concentration of endemic life in the US. And up until the 1960s, uh, it was one of the largest wetlands in Nevada, but of course it got reduced because of groundwater depletion and diversion for irrigation, for um, agriculture areas in the region. Although this is still a super important area, uh, when a lot of those other wetlands shrunk or even disappeared, ash meadows still remained, and it is used heavily for you know, lots of different plants and provides a desert oasis and a stop off for a lot of migratory animals as well. So what's currently being done here? Um, so they've steadily kind of developed their conservation team and acquired a lot more land. They've been hiring on a lot of people. If you've ever been there, they have a pretty new visitor center and they've been you, uh, doing like a lot of trainings to get construction workers on board with identifying invasive species and um, kind of avoiding moving invasive species into the area. Anyone who visits, they've been trying to teach them about that as well. Then the other thing too is the fish conservation facility. It's actually pretty cool. It's an exact replica of Devil's Hole. And um, they had 50 captive pupfish as of 2019. So they pretty much replicate everything, even the pupfish predators, because they want the pupfish to be able to um, adjust to being added back into the Devil's Hole. So if they weren't being predated, then it's a problem because they don't know how to react to predation. So that's uh, one thing that they've been doing as well. So now we'll talk briefly about some of the White River species as well. This area is not as bad, but I still wanted to bring it up. So um, we have got the White River spine dace, and it's actually endemic to the Flag Spring complex. Um, there's the main part of the White River, and then the Flag Springs complex is about 50 miles north. Um, but they're currently critically endangered and they can get pretty colorful. You can see that they have this orange coloration and this also gets to be this kind of bright green color. This gets a lot brighter orange in the males during the spawning season. Uh, but they're about six inches in length and not much is really known about their behaviors. Um, it's kind of still hard to study them since they are pretty rare and hard to find. Um, and then we've also got the Heiko White River springfish, uh, measures at only about one and a half inches, so it's super tiny, but they eat primarily algae and, and uh, detritus, so, um, you know, waste. But uh, the White River spine days prefers cooler pools, but these ones are actually thermal fish and they prefer these super hot springs. So it's pretty crazy because they can survive really high temperatures and low dissolved oxygen, which is really rare for fish to be able to do. Uh, and they actually have natural barriers in their habitat because there is a cold stream that enters the habitat and blocks off the hot water from flowing. And that pretty much keeps them away from the cold water since they can't really survive in really cold water. And this is kind of where the White River is. So it goes all the way down 318. Um, this is kind of where that flag spring complex is up here. And then this is where the Paran Paranagate National Wildlife Ref Refuge is, um, where a lot of the other fish that we're talking about, so our Heiko White River Springfish is as well. And some of the threats facing these ones include uh, predation from a couple different fish, so cichlids um, and shortfin mollies. Those are the two exotic invasive species that live in the river and actually predate them. Um, and then our bigger fish, so um, the spine dace, they've actually been competing with rainbow trout and largemouth bass. And then there's also habitat loss due to redirection of groundwater. So this is generally a pretty all over problem that groundwater in the desert is going to be a huge problem. 
and reducing that like, accessibility to the groundwater is also a pretty controversial topic. So that's always kind of hard to really address because everybody wants water, everybody wants access to it. So it's very difficult. But why is this area so important? So um, the White River and Paranagat area, um, it actually is important. We're thinking of extending the protection of the White River habitat up to Heiko, Nevada, which could help with some of the loss of habitat due to irrigation. So that could possibly help us out a lot. And then also um, protecting this is important because it protects not only our endangered fishes, but also a lot of migratory birds that use the wetlands. So no water means probably not as many migratory birds coming through, which is also something that people care about. Um, if they don't care about the fish, they definitely care about probably the birds. So um, that's another thing to think about as well. So with what is currently being done, um, they're actually establishing a water line and I think it finally got established in June 2019. so that they can remove water from flooded areas and move them over to dried areas. Uh, so this kind of improved the habitat area a little bit. And then also uh, they installed these passive integrated transponders and these track the movement of fish in the stream. So it's pretty cool. They put up an antenna and anytime a fish swims by, it pings that like movement and it sends it to a database where we can collect data on how often they've been moving near that antenna. So that's a good way to even track like how often they're moving between habitats or areas. Okay, so um, the last area is the Colorado River species. So we got a couple of them. So we got the Virgin River Chub. This one is actually endemic to the Virgin River and Moapa River, um, which is kind of in southeast Nevada, just on the border between Utah and Nevada. And uh, these ones actually get really decent size. So a lot of the fish we've covered up to now have been like teeny tiny little fish, but these ones are a lot bigger. Um, so they can be between eight and 12 inches in length. Um, they're gonna be feeding mostly on algae. And during spawning, the males develop this bright orange color patches, usually just behind the gills or on the cheeks. Uh, so they can be really pretty um, and they're pretty cool. Then we've got our bony tail chub. Um, the bony tail chub is actually pretty, um, they're critically endangered. So they can be up to two feet in length and they're going, mostly their extent of their range is pretty questionable just because of how much they've been decimated after the Hoover Dam was built. Um, and they're considered pretty much functionally extinct now. So that's the hard part of the challenge with these ones. They were listed in 1980, but recovery efforts have been pretty, um, you know, unsuccessful. So this one has been really hard to successfully be able to reintroduce and to fix their problems as well. You'll notice that they have this kind of weird hump behind their head. Um, so that's pretty cool. It's actually for sexual selection and also helps them to balance in the water and blend into the environment. They've got this darker pattern on top. So it's like this dark gray color, but they're very light on the bottom. And this is so that any, um, any prey from above won't be able to see them. They'll blend into the dark floor of the river, but also any prey from below will just see the light of the, um, the sky up above the river as well. But these guys can get up to two feet in length, so they're much bigger. Then we've got the Paranagate round tail chub. Um, these are medium size, so between 10 and 20 inches, and they prefer warm to cool water over a wide range of elevations. So they're not just in one area, they're kind of all over the place. Uh, they're omnivorous, so they feed on algae and also macroinvertebrates like insects. Um, but they're really important because they actually will eat like mosquito larvae. So they kind of help us, you know, to, I guess, control that mosquito population, that pest population as well. And then a couple more. So we've got the wound fin, which was listed in 1970. And they're found in the Virgin and the Gila rivers, and they've actually just declined pretty steeply in all of their native habitat, and they're currently critically endangered. Uh, but they also feed on insect larvae, so they're pretty important as well for controlling those pest insect populations. Um, and they also live in a pretty good variety of temperatures as well. 
And we've got the Razorback Sucker, which was listed in 1991. Uh, this one's pretty cool because it was one of the oldest native fish species of the Colorado River. So it's definitely a staple fish species that we want to save. It's about one and a half feet in length on average, uh, so roughly about 10 pounds. And like many other fish of its kind, uh, the Colorado River, um, it feeds mostly on algae and small invertebrates. So it's not much different than the ones we already kind of talked about. This one's interesting because it lives in the deepest parts of the Colorado River. It doesn't like to go into shallow water unless it's spawning. Um, and it's very sensitive and receptive to UV light. So it lives where UV light cannot penetrate normally. Uh, but during the spawning season, it's willing to kind of deal with it to go to areas where it'll spawn in those uh, shallow eddies. So this is kind of the area that they're in. So this is like the uh, Lake Mead area slash uh, Colorado River. You can see that it pretty much borders the entire state of Nevada on the southern end. Oh, I got somebody in my door, but it's okay. All right. And some of their threats include uh, the human impacts from the mines, dams, recreation, and groundwater use. Um, and that caused the river to drop significantly. And then there was also significant effects of climate change, obviously contributing to drying up of the river. And then competition with non-native fishes and invasive species as well. So massive logging projects, damming, runoff from local mines. Um, the Colorado River was pretty badly abused um, over a century ago, and we're still facing the effects of this today. So some of the challenges with this um, include, you know, the Colorado River is, is 14 or 1,450 miles. So you can see that it goes through several states. And a lot of these fish cross state lines often. So managing them, we all kind of have to work together. And Nevada mostly works with Utah and Arizona when it comes to management of these species as well. And the river suffered a lot of irreversible damage as we can see. Uh, we've had a lot of dams, we've had a lot of irrigation canals and uh, diversion of streams. So this has been a really big problem. It's destroyed a lot of that really valuable riparian area as well. So what's currently being done, um, this one's kind of tough because there's a lot trying to be done. A lot of groups are actually trying to save the Colorado River. Um, but one of the things that actually just recently came up that I found interesting was that they're trying to ban ornamental grasses in unused municipal areas in the Las Vegas area. So um, these grasses require a lot of water. So this would be a really good thing for reducing water use. Um, in certain areas, they've been reintroducing hatchery raised fish. So mostly for bony tail chub, moonfin, and razorback sucker. And that's been not only in our state, but other states as well. And with that, uh, we kind of have been expecting a drought. So droughts expected throughout 2021 and beyond. And so Las Vegas especially has done a lot of contingency plans um, to reduce uh, water use overall and also to recycle water and increase the efficiency of how we use it. So we can see that this, these are some pretty concerning. This was January, 2021. Um, the dark red area is like severe drought and you can see how much it's come up the state. So severe drought is creeping up on us. So we need to make plans to be prepared for that as well. And why is the Colorado River so important? Um, so obviously it provides a lot of free ecological services, obviously water, but also water filtration, uh, creates beautiful riparian areas that provide green zones for us to cool down the area, uh, provides us with uh, recreation, natural beauty, rec uh, you know, areas to go and explore. Also has 40 endemic fish species and provides stability in their environment that would be lost if they were extinct. Um, and the other thing about that is that biodiversity is a really big factor. Um, and we have a lot of indicator species. So the reason that we know a lot of the times that drought is coming, uh, a lot of these fish are really good indicator species of telling us what we can expect with environmental changes even years before we can expect it to happen. So listening to the wildlife in the area is incredibly important as well. So um, I'll open up the chat again. So now that we kind of know about some of the threats facing um, a lot of our fish in this area, how can you help? So there are a couple of ways that you can help. Um, just curious to see if anyone wants to suggest anything. It could be as simple as like, 
using less water or, you know, um, making sure that you're not dumping any invasive species in the water, um, even on accident, you know, getting your uh, watercraft checked or anything like that. But yeah, so with helping our endangered fishes, there's a few ways to do it. So one way you can reduce your water use. So this means like maybe planting more native plants that are drought tolerant, especially if you live in Nevada. Um, fishing responsibly. So making sure that you're not putting any bait fish in that could be invasive or a problem. Um, making sure that you're fishing for the right fish. Uh, checking your watercrafts. Uh, that also goes back to reducing the impact of invasive species and then supporting conservation legislation. So when you know that there is any kind of legislation that might support, you know, um, the ESA or any kind of uh, management or conservation strategies, uh, supporting that can help so much because it really puts into effect uh, how we can actually come together and make a big change for our fishes. And so with that, um, let's see if we have any questions. Oh yeah, so um, Lori said using native low water plants, absolutely. So yeah, that's a huge thing. Um, if you have plants that just take a ton of water, they can actually be a really big nuisance. Number one, because you're having to constantly water them and number two, because they're more likely to not do well. So it's better to probably plant native plants, maybe not lawns, try to do zero scape or just native grasses will help a lot as well. All right, so if you have any additional comments or questions that maybe I didn't get to today, or maybe you're just shy and you don't want to ask them right now, um, you can always email me. This is my email right here, endow2.americorps at gmail.com. And we also have a post-program survey. So if there's anything you want to see change or any comments or concerns or anything like that, uh, please feel free to fill out that program survey. But other than that, thank you all so much for coming and learning more about some of our fishes.